So the virtual PsyCon series is part of the conference Science Journalism in the Digital Age, which is organized by Wissenschafts Pressekonferenz, the Association of German Science Journalists, and ACATEC. This is the German National Academy of Science and Engineering. And in May this year, the PsyCon Working Conference will take part where we want to discuss what we can do for science journalism in Germany, especially against the backdrop of the expert lectures that we heard in the last couple of months that we hear today and in the coming weeks. And the working conference, as well as our online lecture series are made possible thanks to a grant from Germany's Federal Ministry of Education and Research. All of our sessions of this lecture series are recorded and transcribed to create a knowledge repository as input for our further discussions. And you can take a look at um, those knowledge repository at science-journalism.eu, our website. So everybody please note, today's session will also be recorded. So we are very delighted that three experts have joined us today and we will proceed as follows. I would suggest that we now first hear the three lectures on best practices in journalism funding from the United Kingdom, from Canada and from the European Union, each uh, input around 10 minutes. And if you, the audience, have any thoughts or questions, please don't hesitate to write them in our chat here in Zoom. And after the three inputs, we will come back to your questions and we will have around 15 minutes for further Q&A and discussions. So we will start with Professor Jonathan Heward from the United Kingdom. He is the founder and CEO of Impress, which seeks to ensure that quality independent journalism flourishes in the digital age. Jonathan is currently on second man to the Public Interest News Foundation, which was launched in 2019 and which is implementing the recommendations of the Independent Publishers Task Force, which was established under Impress. So, Jonathan, we are very much looking forward to your presentation. We are delighted to have you here today, and the floor is yours. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christopher. Danke schön. It's very nice to be here. Um, I will, as you said, I'll speak for about 10 minutes. I've just put the timer on my phone. So, if you hear a pinging noise, it means that I have gone on too long. And I'm going to share my screen just so you can see a few slides. Um, that I prepared, uh, which I hope will help to set the scene. Okay, so the question that you have set, the essay question, is what are state bodies doing to promote journalism? So I'm obviously going to talk about what, what, what's happening here in the UK. But Christopher, just to correct your opening remarks, sadly, I don't think I can speak to best practice because I would not describe the UK as a best practice country in this respect. In fact, I'm not sure I would describe the UK as a best practice country in many respects, except perhaps vaccine uh, production, um, but let's not go there. Uh, and certainly in terms of journalism support and funding, I would say that the picture here is quite chaotic and confused and incoherent and I'll try to explain that. I'm not saying nothing is happening, some interesting things are happening but they're certainly not joined up and I think they are at best ineffectual, at worst possibly even counterproductive. So just very briefly to begin with, um, as, as Christopher said in his introduction, I um, am the Executive Director of the Public Interest News Foundation um, now, some of the genesis that the foundation came through the Cairncross Review, and I think you have heard from Frances Cairncross earlier in this series, she was commissioned by the government to review the sustainability of public interest journalism. 
in the UK. She published her report in February 2019, and she recommended that the government should create a new institute for public interest news, which would act as a, as a single um, point of authority and coordination for anything that was happening, both publicly, but also through philanthropy to support high quality public interest journalism in the UK. But the government, unfortunately, in my view, rejected that proposal. They said, and we could discuss this in the Q&A, they said that they did not think it was the job of the government to define public interest news and that to do so would compromise press freedom. Now, again, as I say, we can talk about that, but that was their stated position and their reason for not creating a public institute. So instead, I and, and others working in civil society created the Public Interest News Foundation, trying to take on some of the, the ideas that were set out in the Cairn Cross Review, but acknowledging that this was not to be a public state body, it's a private charitable uh, body. We got charitable status in September of last year, and we're now in the process of raising funding and developing programmes. And the three programmes that we are developing are a grant making programme, obviously, to try to to bring funding into journalism, a leadership program to support those people who are leading news organizations, particularly the smaller organizations which are really struggling and research, um, including something we call the PINF index, which is designed to produce a really good map of the public interest news landscape in the UK. So that's PINF, but as I say, PINF is not a state body. So put that to one side for a moment. So let's look at what the state is doing. So there are three initiatives which have been launched or are currently ongoing in the UK. The BBC Local Democracy Reporting Service, the Nesta Future News Pilot Fund, and something called the All In Together Advertising Campaign. So let me summarise those each in turn. The BBC Local Democracy Reporting Service was launched in 2016 at the time that the BBC, which, as you know, is our public service broadcaster, the BBC every 10 years has to renegotiate its charter and its funding settlement with the government. At the last review of its funding in 2016, the BBC agreed that in order to address concerns from the newspaper industry about the market impact of the BBC on the commercial newspaper industry, the BBC agreed that they would provide £8 million a year to the commercial newspaper industry. So that £8 million comes from the BBC licence fee. So all of us in the UK who own a television, we pay a licence fee every year. That funds the BBC. And the BBC has essentially sliced a tiny amount off the top of that licence fee. And every year, currently, they're giving it to 10 news publishers. Not very many, you might say. The remit of the scheme is to provide impartial coverage of local authorities in the UK and other relevant democratic institutions. So, for instance, local courts, uh, police and crime commissioners and public agencies which are based in particular regions of the UK. Through the funding, um, the BBC is supporting 149 local democracy reporters. Now, these reporters are employed by the newspaper companies. The BBC gives the money to the newspaper company. The newspaper company then employs one or more of these reporters in each of the different regions and localities of the UK, and they then go out and report on the local council. So it's an important piece of the democratic work of local journalism, which at the moment the market is failing to provide. So the BBC is subsidising that. For me, one of the most um, troubling aspects of the scheme is that almost all of that public money is going to three companies. Um, we have a very concentrated local news market in this country. Three com companies dominate that market, NewsQuest, Reach and JPI. So of those 149 local democracy reporters, 139.5 of them. That's not the person who's cut down the middle. That's that's one post, which is a part-time post. So essentially 95% of those contracts go to those three companies. 
the decisions about who which publishers got the funding was were they, those decisions were made entirely in-house by the BBC. They've had a very light touch evaluation of the scheme. So it's very hard to say whether or not the scheme is actually helping to enhance local democracy or in, enhance the public understanding of democratic processes or to improve decision making. It's, it's very hard to say with any confidence whether or not the scheme is having any positive impact like that because there hasn't really been a very in-depth evaluation and that scheme is currently ongoing. We're now halfway through the, the, um, the, the life of the, of, the, of the scheme. The other initiative was, I think, slightly more imaginative, but sadly very short-lived. This was proposed by Dame Frances Cain Cross, and it's the one thing that the government did take forward. She said that there should be a fund for innovation. So this was designed not to support business as usual journalism, but to support news organizations who want to develop new things. And in particular, to develop, as it says here, reimagining the engagement of communities. So publishers or other civil society organizations that really want to rethink how does journalism engage with the communities it serves and also to explore models of financial sustainability. So this was a relatively small fund. It was two million pounds provided by the government out of taxation, but administered independently by a charity called Nesta, um, which is um, a, an, an innovation specialist charitable foundation here in the UK. And they used the funding to support 20 grantees, um, recipient organizations, as I say, some of those organizations are actual news publishers and others are other kinds of organization working, for instance, with particular um, communities. The decisions about the funding were made by Nesta, but with an advisory panel. And there was a very detailed evaluation and they made recommendations about how the fund might be developed, expanded, um, improved in some ways, but the government has chosen not to do any of that. So that two million pounds was used for a pilot, but the pilot, has not gone anywhere. It's essentially dead in the water. And then thirdly, last year, as the COVID crisis began to really bite, the government uh, was heavily lobbied by the newspaper industry for support. And the support they provided took the form of an advertising campaign. So this again comes from general government funding, but it's funding which is dedicated to promoting government messages in this case, these were messages around COVID and public safety, social distancing, and so on. So through that scheme, the government provided 35 million pounds. That went to 614 print publications. For some reason, they all had to be print. The government would not fund digital publications. Um, I realize now I have hit 10 minutes. So I'll, I'll just speak for one more minute. Um, and the government, I think, had slightly mixed and confused objectives with this fund. At the same time, they were trying to provide what they called a vital boost to the media industry, but also to de deliver important government communications on coronavirus. I'm not sure, that sure those two objectives are, are actually perfectly aligned. As you can see from the image, what, what was funded through this was that the newspapers ran what we call advertorials or sponsored content. So material which looks like editorially independent material, but in fact has been co-created with the government to promote government messages. Now, some of those messages were very straight down the line public health messages. Others, in my view, were rather more um, what you might call promoting government policy and promoting this particular government and the choices that it has made. Now, I, I'm not totally comfortable with that as a model of funding the newspaper industry for reasons which we can discuss. Also, sadly, once again, a majority of funding went to those same three companies which have already swallowed up the industry. Only one of the publishers that received funding was um, one of what we call the, the more independent or community sector. The decisions about funding were made by an advertising agency called OmniGov. So not a, not, there, were no, there were no criteria about the quality or the public interest value or the sustainability of the news organizations. They were made on purely commercial terms from advertising metrics. There was no evaluation of that, and that is ongoing. 
So I would just say in, in conclusion that the, that the reasons that I'm unhappy with the state of affairs in the UK is that there is no, there are no clear objectives um, the image here is a black hole. I mean, there's the, the idea is that there is, the government is putting money into this, but it's kind of going into a black hole. We don't know where it's going. We don't know what impact it's having. So the lack of objectives, if there were to be objectives, I would say they should be focused on sustainability, on the public interest and on diversity in the media. We desperately need independent decision making and evaluation. And we really need a multi-year commitment. We can't have stop-start initiatives which run for six months and then they're discontinued because it's a huge waste of everybody's time trying to meet those criteria and then having to make up something new the following year. So I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan, I'll for stop the sharing. insightful overview of what is happening in United Kingdom. And... Um, uh, perhaps not best practice, as you said, but let's see if Canada does a better job. And let's proceed um, to Professor Karen Poglazy. Um, she's professor at Ryerson University School of Journalism in Toronto, Canada. And she's also the past president of the Canadian Association of Journalists. In 2019, the Canadian government announced it would provide almost 595 million Canadian dollar over five years in incentives to Canada's ailing news media. And um, Karen will speak about uh, this controversial topic in Canada now. So we are very much looking forward to your um, lecture. You're still muted. Sorry, I, I needed the unmute powers. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, uh, Christopher, I'm gonna say what Jonathan said because I'd made a note when you had initially said best practices to assure you that these are not best practices but um, more likely emergency measures. Um, I'm also, because we are all journalists, gonna start my timer. And if you hear it ping, I have also gone over but I'm confident I won't. <laughs> Um, I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about the news system in Canada and how it's funded. We do have a mixed system of private and public and private and public regulation as well. We have a very small population that is spread across um, a wide geography, which makes it difficult to support media in the first place, especially multilingual and multicultural media. So the, um, I'm going to start with broadcast. National Public Radio and Television in Canada is the CBC. It receives $1 billion in government funding and also has self-sourced ad revenue to the tune of $490 million. There are also some provincial media like TV Ontario in the province of the same name, which receive funding from the province. The majority of media and what we're going to talk about today, though, are private newspapers, online and broadcast. In the online media, there are both the legacy media, so those old radio stations, those old broadcast broadcasters and newspapers that have always been around that are now also extending themselves online, and new players. As the shakeup started to happen in the media industry and people were laid off, some of these new players opened up. They tend to be small little mom and pop newsrooms that have moved in to fill in spaces where beats were dropped or uh, localities were dropped as legacy media shut down and laid off reporters. Um, all newspapers and online media, except for CBC Online, are funded uh, privately through a mixture of ads, subscriptions, or crowdfunding. I'm going to stick with broadcast and private broadcasters for a second, uh, because the broadcast system in Canada may be different than in your country. We have um, a public but arm's length government regulator for radio and television called the CRTC. The CRTC will license radio and uh, television stations and it holds hearings and creates mandates for service. So if there is one radio license available, people who want that license will compete for it, arguing that they will provide a superior service. Members of the public will intervene to advise the CRTC on what the best service should look like this may include terms like offering daily news, service in a language that is not currently served in the region, et cetera. The CRTC decides who, if anyone, should get a license. In the case of radio licenses, that is all because private radio is almost entirely funded through advertising. 
In the case of television stations, this is a bit different. In most countries, cable companies, which are private, will decide if they want to carry a television station. And if so, what among the cable subscriber fees they will pay as they collect money from cable subscribers, they will pay so many cents uh, to a station uh, per carriage for the privilege of carrying it. In Canada, this is not privately negotiated. Stations, television stations will go to the CRTC and ask for a rate and the CRTC decides what the cable company will pay if they wish to carry that station. They can walk away in most cases and say, I don't want to carry your station. But the CRTC also has the ability to make a station must carry, which it rarely does. But this is the case for APTN, which was the world's first Indigenous owned and broadcaster where I used to work. The CRTC set the rate, but also told cable stations they had no choice but to carry the station. All of this to say there's a public regulatory body that does have the power to set income earned from cable subscriber fees for television broadcasters. So two things are impacting media in Canada. All media are losing ad revenue due to online entities such as Google and Facebook coming in and snatching those rev revenues. And broadcasters have additionally lost re ad revenue from cable subscriber fees as people start to cancel their cable subscriptions. We call it cord cutting, and um, that has put television stations also at risk. So the private companies have been trying to do things to make up the lost ad revenue. There's been some recognition that programming will move online. So newspapers have tried various models, but lately paywalls are the conventional convention for legacy media. New startups tend to prefer crowdfunding and both use ads although online ads earn less revenue per ad than print ads and hard copy, which is one reason why these legacy models uh, of newspapers keep hard copy around. There have also been failed initiatives, um, attempts to make apps, or really unconventional ones like partnering software or uh, casinos or other companies where those companies would earn money and you would flush it into the business. None of these have taken off. Uh, Canadian broadcasters have also moved online, opening these Netflix-like Netflix apps, which they gather revenue through ads or paywalls. Um, but a lot of our entertainment offered online is actually US content. So why should people pay for that when they can get it on Netflix? So none of this change has replaced lost ad revenue or lost revenue entirely. Um, there are constant closures of newspapers and layoffs of reporters and broadcasters are also in trouble. A recent report from the Canadian Association of Broadcasters predicted that we could lose 200 stations in two years, plus 40 or more of Canada's 94 private local television stations. And I have lost count of the number of closures of newspapers, but I'm told that there's expectations of about a thousand journalists out of 3000 being laid off this year. So we are in crisis. What has the government done? Well, in broadcast, nothing for news. There have been negotiations with Netflix to invest in Canadian programming, like entertainment programming. Um, but um, there's been nothing really to support the news industry. Most of the focus has been on newspapers, which have been sort of the canary in the coal mine. Um, as legacy print publications have been most impacted, um, there's also been a cry from startups. The new media that came in to replace the legacy media that was failing um, have complained that if you go and support the legacy media, they should not be left out. So there's been this question, do you fund innovation or do you fund what is existing? Um, there have been a couple of government initiatives that I'll talk about. Two years ago, the government set aside nearly 600 million over five years for tax credits and other initiatives aimed at propping up struggling news outlets. Qualified Canadian journalism organizations, and there was debate about what that meant, could claim a 25% refundable tax credit on the salaries of eligible workers, subject to a cap of $55,000 um, for a maximum credit of uh, $13,750 uh, per employee. Qualified news agencies were those who had 60% written content other than video and audio and a minimum of 50% original news content. They had to be sizable and they had to have existed for at least two years. 
Uh, a second initiative made it easier for not-for-profit news organizations to apply for charitable status. Again, Aboriginal People's Television Network, where I worked, was a charity. But in Canada, we don't have that tradition of um, uh, not-for-profit news. So this was supposed to make it easier to allow news organizations to start up, take in donations, and issue tax receipts to donors um, to boost the crowdfunding models. Uh, finally, Canadians who pay for a digital news subscription from a qualified news media out outlet were allowed a 15% tax credit for a maximum of $75, or sorry, $75 not $75,000 per year per, per, per subscription. Now, there was also a smaller fund aimed at, um, this is a second initiative, aimed at subsidizing, subsidizing local media initiatives. This was called the Local Media Initiative Fund, $50 million over five years to hire reporters to cover underserved communities. We use the terms news poverty. So that might be that you have a community that does have a paper, but let's say it's a First Nations community. Um, it doesn't get reported on or news deserts where there's simply no local news anymore. That's how we define underserved. This is paid for the salaries of 160 journalists in 140 newsrooms across, across Canada, but mostly the money has gone to large legacy news outlets um, that are either newspapers or online and, or both. Many of the startups have, only a small amount of startups have received uh, money for journalists under that initiative. These were all very controversial for knee-jerk reasons that one can immediately think of. Will news be unbiased if it receives money from government? but also because of the distance that government needed to take to ensure that there would be no suspicion that it was influencing the news meant that there was very little accountability built into the funding. So I can speak more on those details later, but um, you could take this funding for journalists and continue to lay off journalists. You could take this money for journalists and take the savings and invest it in a CEO salary. That's my timer, I'm almost done though. Um, so those were the kind of questions that were coming up because there's no accountability for really, that money has to be sent on salaries, but where does the savings go? Does it get reinvested in actual news production or does it do something else? There's no accountability for that. Another criticism was that this was a Band-Aid solution for legacy media. Um, you're solving the problem right now, but in five years where that funding runs out, aren't we right back where we started? Does it just constantly be renewed with media organizations going hat in hand to the government asking for yet another handout to survive? Why weren't we funding innovation instead? Um, so uh, just speaking to the most recent uh, evolution of things uh, in Australia, Canada's uh, attempt, to, next attempt um, is to look to the places that have been taking the ad revenue uh, away from newspapers such as Google and Facebook and other online media giants. And it's been similar to, they've taken a similar tack to Australia where they're looking at should these, uh, should these places be paying media for carrying their content. Um, our Canadian Heritage Minister has been working with a coalition of countries, including Australia, Finland, France, and Germany, to discuss a common front on news and uh, related issues in that respect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karen, for drawing this very illuminating paper, uh, uh, um, uh, picture of the situation in, in Canada and um, for joining us today, for being here today. Thanks. Um, Yes, yeah, we might see some uh, patterns emerging if we compare the UK to Canada, especially in terms of innovation funding and legacy media taking the lion's share of uh, state money, but we might discuss this later on. We have the first questions in the chat already on the aspect of innovation. So everybody of our participants is very much invited to write in the chat. If you have questions or remarks, please don't hesitate to write them in the chat. So. Now we will proceed to the European level. We have with us Ivan Brinkett, who is a policy officer at the Directorate General for Communications, Network, Content and Technology at the European Commission. 
uh, with its new European action plan for democracy, the EU wants to empower citizens and build stronger democracies across Europe. Uh, so we are very much interested to hear from you. Even thanks for being with us today, for joining us. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I also set my timer. Uh, I hope I will not exceed uh, the 10 minutes, but probably I will, seeing uh, the experience from the from the previous uh, speakers. Uh, what, I, what I want to start with is that, uh, unlike the previous speakers, uh, I'm, I'm working in policy. So maybe uh, the criticism will come uh, at a later stage uh, in your Q&A. Uh, uh, and I will uh, then happily uh, try to, to respond. Uh, and again, our starting point, uh, I work uh, in, in the unit responsible for the Creative Europe uh, media program. Uh, now, the media program is, uh, uh, is a bit misleading uh, because the acronym uh, stands for support to the, to the audiovisual uh, industry. But for the first time, uh, the Creative Europe program, uh, when it will be adopted, uh, will have uh, support uh, to, to news media, which, why, which I will uh, come back uh, uh, at a later stage. I think, and we, we can all agree, 2020 was definitely a transformative year uh, for, for everybody and for media it was definitely no exception. Uh, we had the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and the accompanying uh, infodemic, uh, a flood of misinformation and disinformation, uh, which exposed a lot of uh, vulnerabilities uh, in our societies and the need for action. Uh, and the European Commission uh, adopted a number of actions linked to media uh, in December. Uh, and. Uh, uh, while the purpose of this talk is to is to speak mainly about the funding instruments, I think we need to look at uh, maybe the wider context uh, first. So uh, I would like to start with the uh, with the European Democracy Action Plan, uh, which was adopted in December 2020, uh, together with the first ever uh, media and audiovisual uh, action plan. In terms of the democracy action plan, uh, the aim, of course, is to make our societies more resilient and better prepared for the future, and our democracies more resistant to the spread of disinformation. Uh, the action plan seeks to empower citizens and civil society uh, to counter these threats. The crisis has definitely put uh, added strain on, uh, on media across, uh, across Europe. We've seen economic hardship, restrictive uh, emergency measures, attacks on journalists uh, uh, are in a way reducing the space for a free and fair debate uh, grounded on facts and good reporting. Uh, the online space, on the other hand, gained viewers, followers, users, uh, though it is difficult to uphold fundamental rights and democracy, in a largely unregulated online space, especially when the business models of social media platforms uh, do not always encourage free and open debate. Allowing polarizing messages and unreliable information to be spread easily can limit our perspectives and hamper our ability to make informed political decisions, which has a dangerous effect on our democratic societies. Uh, this is why the Commission put forward measures to strengthen media free freedom and pluralism, uh, alongside measures to fight disinformation and promote free and fair elections. Now, on countering disinformation, uh, the Commission had already adopted a, a code of practice uh, with, uh, uh, with, with stakeholders, uh, and the aim uh, is uh, to uh, strengthen this by issuing guidance uh, and setting up a more robust uh, framework for monitoring uh, its implementation. Uh, again, uh, uh, and I speak from uh, from my, my experience. As, as I said, uh, I uh, unlike the previous speakers, I'm uh, I'm working in policy, though I started my career in, in journalism. So I think uh, again, I can I can understand and recognize the uh, the the perils and the difficulties. Uh, of, uh, of public organizations uh, to, to deal with, with the issue. So I think our, what's, what's fundamental is that when fighting disinformation, uh, our work uh, in the commission uh, remains firmly rooted in European values and principles, uh, including of course, freedom of expression 
uh, and the right to access legal content. Now, uh, I will turn uh, to what is uh, the core uh, of, uh, of this uh, talk, which is the funding uh, for, for journalism uh, and uh, de facto the media and audiovisual uh, action plan. Uh, here, uh, again, uh, media freedom and pluralism uh, is also being threatened by economic fa factors. Uh, it's, uh, it's clearly a fact uh, that uh, uh, the, the, media, the news media sector is, uh, is suffering, is struggling. We've seen a dramatic fall in advertising income. Uh, over, it's been uh, coming. You could say it's, uh, it's an accelerating uh, trend. Uh, and uh, this accelerating trend, uh, because of COVID, has uh, accelerated, uh, despite the fact that uh, audiences and readers uh, have increased. So the plan aims to support the media sector's uh, recovery and at the same time address the, uh, the digital transformation and overall competitiveness of the, of the sector. And it focuses on three areas, uh, recover, transform, uh, and uh, to enable and, uh, and empower. Uh, now, in terms of uh, recovery, uh, under the media and audiovisual plan, uh, we will launch what we call the news initiative, uh, which is a bundling uh, of uh, actions and support for the for the news media sector. Uh, one of this is uh, basically better access to finance uh, through loans. Uh, and the pilot equity uh, initiative. Uh, capacity building among, among investors and media to increase investors' knowledge of the European news media market. Uh, and here we're using uh, our experience, uh, which we've gained uh, in supporting the creative uh, industries. Uh, one of the issues we found is that financial uh, institutions uh, are not necessarily uh, aware of the of the needs of the business models uh, uh, of the of the creative industries. Uh, so uh, we're basically uh, helping uh, to to build this capacity uh, to to basically inform uh, investors, uh, foundations uh, on on the importance of uh, uh, of investing uh, and of. Uh, uh, providing access to finance to, to the European news media market. Uh, as I said, uh, we're going to support news media and collaborative transformation through Creative Europe grants uh, for collaborative media partnerships. Uh, these grants will be available to test uh, new business models, uh, in particular local media, assisting media in developing their business and editorial standards, uh, promoting collaborative and cross-border journalism, training and mobility, of professionals uh, and sharing of best practices. Uh, this is the first time that Creative Europe program uh, will have dedicated calls for journalism partnerships. Before the, uh, the action plan, we were already working also, uh, again, based on our experience in the audiovisual uh, industry uh, and also uh, uh, to aid in the uh, in helping uh, the sector to, uh, to, to innovate, uh, to create a tool that provides a clear snapshot of the funding instruments available uh, in, in the sector. And we, we will be extending this tool also for funding possibilities for, uh, for news media, media companies. So uh, you could call it a one-stop uh, shop, uh, a website which uh, uh, which allows uh, all possible uh, beneficiaries uh, to be able to see uh, what sort of support they can get uh, at, at European uh, level, uh, whether it is through uh, research and, uh, and innovation uh, funds, through Creative Europe, uh, etc. Uh, moreover, uh, and I think uh, uh, one of the strengths, again, uh, coming from our experience uh, in Creative Europe, uh, is uh, is to engage with uh, with the news media uh, with uh, in what we're calling a European news media forum, uh, and what we want to do uh, through this news media forum is to create a, uh, a platform uh, where uh, again we can share uh, best practice. We can uh, we can create a space for for discussion. Uh, and the way we're seeing, and uh, at the moment we're still uh, in the. 
uh, embryonic uh, phase of uh, of devising how, uh, and determining how the European News Media Forum will look like. Uh, but our thinking is that we'll we'll have a spring event which will focus uh, on on journalists uh, and normally an autumn event which will. Uh, focus more or on uh, industrial transformation uh, of the of the sector. Uh, that's my timer, uh, but I'll soon be be ready. <laughs> uh, so as as I said, uh, the first uh, the first event uh, and it will take place uh, towards the end of March. So I'll be happy to provide uh, more information uh, even by by email uh, once the program is uh, is ready. Uh, it will be uh, regarding safety of journalists, uh, and it will take place, as I said, at the end of this uh, this month. Uh, and then uh, towards uh, the the last uh, part of the third quarter or the beginning of the of the fourth quarter of of this year, we we'll organize the uh, the more uh, industry focused uh, event. Uh, so bringing uh, uh, together. Uh, stakeholders uh, to discuss the needs of the of the industry. Uh, in conclusion, uh, I think the logic of the Creative Europe program has always been to focus on sector-wide uh, collaboration. So, to bring uh, players from different parts of the of the value chain uh, together uh, to collaborate, to speak, maybe to scale up, uh, always in respect of uh, editorial and creative independence. Uh, now, we are aware that uh, the new media part of Creative Europe, uh, which will be adopted uh, hopefully soon by the European Council and Parliament, uh, is, is small. Uh, it's just 9% of the, of the budget uh, uh, under the cross-sectorial strand, which is, uh, which is also shared by other initiatives. Uh, but it's a start, and I think that's uh, that that's the the message uh, we want uh, to to deliver. I think, uh, from a political point of view, there seems to be the willingness uh, to uh, to look at uh, the problems uh, faced uh, by the by the media sector, uh, and then uh, the question, of course, will be uh, on the how uh, respecting uh, the uh, the European. Uh, principles. Thank you. Even thank you very much for highlighting how the European Union uh, is trying to foster the European news media. Um, yeah, so everybody, thank you so much for joining us and for giving these very, very informative inputs. And now let's proceed with a Q&A and uh, discussion. So um, everybody of our participants is invited to raise your hand if you have a question and want to, um, want to ask uh, uh, um, on, on uh, uh, um, want to ask them or right in the chat. So we already have some questions in the chat and um, I might begin with a question from Franco Zotta that is um, very much to the point, I think, because what he asked is what should, um, what should state authorities do? So should they um, uh, particularly focus on innovation? So, uh, help the new emerging organizations and innovative players or should they more focus on stabilization or transformation of the old legacy system so where should government authorities uh, um, uh, jump in so um, i don't know who might want to start but just open the microphone and get going Hi, so um, I had a, a couple of ideas about this when we were working through proposals uh, with the government. Um, I thought that they could do some stabilization um, to keep the legacy media sort of going um, on a short term basis, uh, you know, while also funding innovation. And uh, I saw a question in the chat, what do you mean by innovation? There's so many ways to define in innovation in terms of journalism content. But in this particular case, I mean, uh, the search for new business models that would purport, that would support um, either legacy media or their startups moving in. One of the things that I had proposed is to create something that particularly funds um, new media that are trying out new ideas. 
And we call this sometimes in economics, the infant industry argument. So the idea is that you make a small amount of funding available or amount of funding available that might fund 100% of a project the first year, knowing full well that the next year it's going to be 50 and the next year it's going to be 20. So that you have a chance to try to get something working and you are slowly weaning off uh, government funding rather than having this perpetual business of going back every five years and asking the government to fund reporters and fund more and more reporters. Yeah, if, if, if I may add to that, I think uh, that is uh, a fundamental uh, point which you, which you make, uh, Karin. Uh, and uh, if I speak from my personal experience, and this is my uh, personal uh, opinion, uh, I think uh, one of the risks of um, of funding, uh, uh, so uh, you have you have an issue with uh, which is a media sector which uh, definitely requires uh, a lot of support uh, to keep the the status uh, the status quo uh, to keep offering uh, a basic level of of service, uh, and uh, that requires short term short term funding. Uh, the problem with with that is that uh, eventually it leads to, to reliance, uh, as you said, and it leads also to uh, uh, to what I call a chicken and uh, and egg situation, which is that uh, it it leads to uh, less experimentation with uh, with trying to find uh, new sustainable business uh, business models. Uh, and I think this is the balance uh, we as uh, uh, policy uh, uh, in, in in government need need to to try and, and find, which is to create a space, uh, definitely to, to stabilize the, the system, to, to support uh, where it is really necessary, uh, not to have uh, uh, the whole system col collapsing or uh, major players uh, uh, disappearing. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we need to have a space uh, to allow for uh, innovation, to allow for new business models, because uh, definitely, the existing, or let's say, the legacy business model uh, is is broken, uh, and I think we need we need to ac acknowledge uh, that probably, uh, and and look at how uh, we can find a, a new model. Yeah, but I would add to that to say that I think we have to recognise we're we're living through a massive transition in the way that public interest media is 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 paid for. Um, I mean, some say it's the biggest transition since the 1450s. I mean, let's let's slightly narrow our horizons. It's slightly, certainly the biggest transition since the Second World War. Um, and it's going to take five or 10 years to even begin to work this through. I think if you start from the perspective of the citizen and say, ultimately, what do we think citizens need? And I think they need high quality, accurate local news. They need high quality, accurate specialist news, for instance, science reporting, but also reporting on complex issues like religion, identity, the environment, and so on. And they need some choice. You know, we live in a society where people have very different values and, and worldviews and may not all want to consume the same kind of media. So I feel like ultimately, you know, the vision is of a very rich, diverse, but high quality media ecosystem. The likelihood is that that will have some commercial revenue. There may be new commercial business models. There may be more philanthropic funding. And there may be a greater need for ongoing state funding where there simply is not a commercial or philanthropic model to support the kind of news that citizens need. But we don't, we can't say right now what the ideal balance is or where the funding should go. We need to find a way of, you know, creating enough space over the next 10 years to let the industry find its way forward, give it a best chance. Of, I think of finding non-state forms of support because they do tend to grant greater independence to the media but be very realistic about the likelihood that there will need to be greater state funding beyond that. So everybody is invited to post uh, questions to the chat. Uh, we have a question from Niklas Boop who asks what do you think is innovative media? That obviously is a very relevant question. And um, I wanted to connect it to the question how to find innovative media projects to support. I mean, in the UK, Jonathan, you said that the Nesta News Future Pilot Fund has been discontinued. Um, 
in, in Canada, we have the situation that these 600 million Canadian dollars are uh, given away based on very clear qu quantitative criteria, like 60% of written content and these kind of things. Innovative or innovativeness is really hard to, um, yeah, to observe or how to define it. Uh, so I, I wondered um, if you have any take on that. So how to define what is innovative enough to be supported by such state authorities. So what are measures, how is, can governance work here? So I have such a good on. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you want to go ahead, Jonathan? Go on. No, no, no. Please go on. Okay. I went first last time. That's <laughs> like you can tell I'm in broadcast. Maybe. It's like, sorry. I, I just have such a good example of this um, in Canada. So um, you're right. One of the things that wasn't supported, for example, was podcasts. And one of the uh, innovative podcasts that popped up, and I say popped up because that's actually the new business model was um, a, an entity called Sprawl. Um, it was created initially to cover a local election that was not receiving coverage. It was in a news desert. And so it popped up and said, we are gonna exist for the time that this election is going on and then we will cease. And they did, but people kept funding them. They were completely sourced through crowdfunding. So they said, okay, what is the next topic that is gonna come up that is not receiving coverage that needs to be served in this community? And then they came back and they covered that for uh, an amount of time while that was going on and then it shut down. And they have not been supported any way by any government initiative and do not qualify because they're neither big enough and because they're audio and not print and don't fit any of the definitions. Yeah, I was gonna say, Karen, I mean, that's, that's a really good example. There's another example I like in the States where some uh, of the nonprofit news organizations have been really going back to first principles and saying, let's not assume that we know what information our communities need or how they want to get it. Let's actually you do this extraordinary thing of asking them, what do they not know that they would like to know and how would they like to receive that information? So there's an outfit called um, Outlier Media in Detroit, which concluded that, that the kind of communities that they want to serve, particularly those underserved, underrepresented communities, their primary concern is housing. They are at the mercy of a incredibly complex housing, public housing system. And the way they like to get information is through SMS, through text messages. So Outlier Media said, fine, that's what we'll do. We, we won't write 500 word online news stories. We won't produce 25 minute bulletins on broadcast. We'll send out text messages with, with updates. So I think that's a really interesting kind of innovation where you just, you just forget everything you already know and try and, try and think about the core value that you're providing this project which raised about $50 million of, of funding. And the way they work is with um, newsrooms. I think there's about one in each state. Um, my, is my internet connection okay? It just said it was unstable. It's okay. Yeah, you're back now. But yeah, yeah, fine. Sorry. I was just saying, yeah, so the American Journalism Project invests in individual newsrooms, but it sets them targets for how they will diversify their revenue over, say, three or five years so i think there was a question in the chat about how do you avoid the kind of dependency problem where whether it's a philanthropic or a state funder says you know here's five hundred thousand euros and then in five years time the same organization needs another five hundred thousand or now they need a million so you actually set in the in in the grant conditions you set targets around diversification and then alongside the grant they provide them with intensive coaching business development coaching to actually help them exploit those other potential revenue sourced yeah um jonathan um you might want to answer the question from franco zotta from the chat who asked if these the nesta fund uh, was that a prototype for meaningful government innovation funding from your perspective Yes, Franco. Yeah, it's a good question. Up to a point. My, my only concern with the Nesta Fund was that it was almost excessively focused on innovation. And I do worry that there can be a point when you're funding innovation for the sake of innovation. 
And some of the people in the sector said, for God's sake, you know, we, we don't need new, we know, what the, we know what our needs are. We don't want funding to develop and explore new models. We have a model. We just need a specific bit of investment to help us to exploit the model that we have. So for instance, many people in the UK are very confident that there is a subscription-based revenue model that they could develop. They just need investment in marketing and promotion to, to build the base of subscribers, whether it's in their local area or in a niche field or among a particular identity group. So I think there was some frustration if innovation becomes this kind of religion in its own in its own right, and people are constantly being asked to innovate. Um, so I think with that caveat, slightly loosen up how they interpret innovation it doesn't have to be the most original idea in the world it just needs to be something that you want a bit of extra capacity to develop i think thanks for bringing this to um uh, to the discussion because uh, i think in the next week we will have another session uh with austrian um participants who will talk about the vienna media initiative and they really try to find a balance between on the one hand side the innovativeness of a project and um Uh, the quality, the journalistic quality mm, of the project. Mm. Bringing this together is essential, I think, and thanks That's for right. highlighting this. So there might be one question for Evan. Um, um, we have one from the chat. Mark Gruber asks, is it the role of state bodies to support commercial media? So he means, should public money be used to make a profit? What is the take of the European Union on that? You're still muted, I think. So uh, I think uh, we need to look at it from a, from a much uh, wider perspective. So if we look at uh, uh, the vaccinations, which uh, everyone is, uh, is hoping for, uh, of course, uh, uh, a lot of the funding uh, has come uh, from, uh, from, state, uh, from state bodies uh, and ultimately uh, they're commercial companies uh, and uh, they will make uh, prof profits. Uh, But uh, of, of course, uh, uh, so that, that is the example. Now, should, uh, should we be uh, supporting uh, commercial, commercial media uh, to, to make a profit? Uh, I would say uh, definitely if it comes to innovation, for example, if it, uh, if it comes to uh, helping uh, an organization which is, uh, which is struggling, uh, to find a way to, to survive and, and to flourish, uh, I would say, uh, yes, uh, yes, why not? Uh, I think um, st state funding uh, has, uh, has always led uh, to, uh, uh, to a lot of uh, innovations, uh, pretty much uh, in, in every field uh, of, of our life. Uh, I think I come from, from the DG. Uh, which sort of uh, created the GSM uh, standard through uh, through public uh, funding. Uh, so uh, again, I, I don't see a problem with uh, with private organizations making uh, money uh, as long as the public money is uh, is used uh, transparently uh, is uh, is used. Uh, Uh, not, uh, I think I saw a, a point there. Not to bolster the the salary of a, of a CEO, but uh, to to do something meaningful. Uh, and then, uh, if the uh, if the company or companies uh, manage to innovate and uh, make a profit, uh, so be it. Okay, so I think we are perfectly in time. Um, I think. Uh, Uh, we like to thank you all three for joining us today. So uh, thanks for being with us, for sharing your insights on the question how uh, public authorities can support or could support journalism. That was very insightful. And uh, I'd like to point your attention to next week's lecture series. Uh, we will have another lecture on next uh, Thursday, the 18th at uh, 3 p.m. Central European time. And we will add further perspectives on how state bodies can promote journalism in the digital age. And we will hear perspectives from Denmark, the Netherlands and Austria. And you are all very much invited to join us next week. Uh, that will be also very 
informative. If you would like to inform yourself or register for these um, for the next uh, conference, then uh, click on www.science-journalism.eu. So thanks everybody. Thanks to our three guests and to everybody who organized that. And see you next time again. All the best. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Yeah.